So I have the unenviable task of actually following in two uh, very knowledgeable speakers. Um, so, I've, um, so I've taken the easy way out in, in that I'm going to be speaking uh, as to the business of the internet um, and how that's going to impact uh, or that should impact uh, the, um, the copyright liability um, of online service providers. Uh, and since this is a conference of lawyers, uh, I think it's, uh, it's only appropriate that I sort of note that my views are strictly personal uh, and are not views of the firm or its clients. Um, um, so once that's out of the way, um, uh, it, you know, um, the focus of my topic is really uh, what were the premises uh, from a business standpoint um, for the copyright liability regime for OSPs uh, that was set up at the end of the 90s. Um, are those premises still valid under the internet of today? And if not, um, uh, how should we go in terms of reforming uh, the copyright liability regime? So I really hope to um, sort of raise more provocative questions uh, than give and give firm answers. So, so, so that's going to be a trend you, um, you, will, um, you will see in my talk. Um, so before we actually get into the law governing uh, the copyright liability of OSPs, I think it's important to, to quickly um, set out how the internet looked uh, in the year 2000. Um, so it was, it was fairly rudimentary technology. Um, I mean, you had dial-up internet services. Um, content on the internet was mostly text um, rather than video or audio as you see today. Uh, uh, and, and in terms of content, the, the, I mean, content was mostly uh, um, created by traditional mass media content providers. And by that, I mean newspapers and book publishers. So, um, so newspapers and book publishers create content. That content gets sent to online service providers who then distribute the content to end users. So content essentially moves in one direction. And OSPs are simply distributors of content created by somebody else. And users simply consume, created, uh, consume content created by traditional mass media companies. Um, so, you know, think of, think of the internet as uh, an online platform, the bulletin boards, you know, um, rudimentary hyperlinks and the like. Uh, and, you know, it, it was only fair at the time to, to consider that holding OSPs liable for copyright infringement occurring on their platforms uh, as being unfair. Because, you know, just as would be holding the owner of a wall on which graffiti uh, you know, has been put. I mean, just as it would be unfair to hold an owner of that wall responsible for graffiti, it would also be unfair to hold OSPs um, responsible for, um, for, for content that they neither control uh, 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 or, or otherwise. So there were two premises uh, that, as a policy matter, uh, underwrote the copyright exemption regime at the end of the 90s. One, that OSPs were neutral, and they can't prevent copyright infringement caused by their users. Two, that OSPs were neutral, uh, that you know, they had no preference for any particular content that they hosted, uh, uh, and not the least because they weren't in the content retailing business. They were simply distributing content of somebody else. And finally, uh, and most importantly, it was thought that to have OSPs being in the business of copyright infringement, monitoring their users, uh, would lead to censorship and also come in the way of, um, of freedom of users. So if those were the premises uh, based on the internet as it stood in the year 2000, how did that come to be reflected in the copyright um, liability regime uh, for OSPs? So OSPs um, got broad exemptions from being responsible for copyright infringement so long as they acted as a mere conduit, right? Uh, which they were, because OSPs don't initiate transmission, select the receiver of the transmission, and don't modify the transmission. So that's Article 12 
of the e-commerce directive. OSPs may also cache content and not be responsible for it, so long as they expeditiously act uh, once they become aware that the initial source of the transmission has been removed from the internet. And finally, and most importantly, OSPs may host infringing content, so long as one that they don't have actual knowledge that the content, uh, that the content is infringing, and as soon as they obtain such knowledge that they remove the, uh, that they remove the content, so this is the basis of the whole uh, notice and take down regime. So OSPs are not liable, essentially, until such time as they are made aware that content is infringing, and then they act quickly to take it down. Uh, and indeed, uh, as regards the point on monitoring, Article 15 of the e-commerce directive says that EU member states cannot um, require OSPs to actually monitor information or to set up filtering systems that would ensure that they seek facts that show they're actually hosting infringing content. So, so all of this was set up um, on the basis of the internet as it looked in the year 2000. Now, how does the internet look today? Uh, and, and are the premises of the copyright safe harbor for OSPs set up under the e-commerce directive in the year 2000, does that reflect the business of the internet as it looks today. So so-called web two and web three, uh, you know, oftentimes it's hard to keep track of, you know, I mean the jargon, uh, people have gone up to web five, but you know, I'm just gonna stop at web three. Um, uh, it, it, but uh, the bottom line is the internet, uh, we use broadband, so content on the internet is no longer simple text, it's, it's, you know, it's large video and audio, and most importantly, content on the internet today isn't moving in one direction as it did in the year 2000. Content today is created both by traditional mass media providers, one, two, it's also created by OSPs themselves, and we'll come to this, and third, and most importantly, it's also created by users. So, you know, you, um, so you, or on Facebook, you create a post, you curate content. All of that wa was not that widespread in the year 2000. So in a sense, we're moving, uh, or we have moved from mass media to media of the masses, right? So the so classical principles of excluding OSP liability set up in the year 2000 has increasingly come under strain because judges are seeing that you know, the internet really isn't what it, what it was. Uh, and, and both Owen and Glenn have gone through some of these cases, so I'm just gonna skip over those. Uh, but, but I guess the question to ask is, is the e-commerce directive and the, uh, and the safe harbor exemption regime of the year 2000, should that be changed in light of how business takes place on the internet today? And so if you'll recall, the two premises or three premises of, um, of the safe harbor was OSPs are neutral, OSPs are passive, and OSPs shouldn't be in the business of monitoring their users. Now has all of that changed today? Now, OSPs now retail content, right? So they're not simply distributing content of, uh, are not passing through content as they did previously. OSPs also publish their own proprietary content. Indeed, um, uh, uh, you know, many OSP platforms, their business is predicated on both proprietary content, uh, i.e. of the traditional mass media sources, their own content, and also UGC, content of their users. Second, are USPs neutral relative to content that they host? Um, I mean, how you have, um, now you have um, OSPs who have licensing arrangements with, with third parties. Does that then mean that they have a preference as regards uh, particular content that they host? Uh, could they, for example, give preferential treatment in terms of enforcement? For example, take down infringing content from, from certain rights holders but not from other rights holders? Uh, and I guess a YouTube content ID program is, is, 
is an example of a program where rights holders entered in, have, have entered into a contract with YouTube and, and it gives them the ability to, uh, you know, essentially get quicker takedown of allegedly infringing content. The third is, uh, do we now have dominant OSP platforms? I mean, Google, for example, dominates search. Um, and, and the original e-commerce directive um, notice and takedown structure, intentionally or unintentionally, um, had a particular structural element built into it, which was it would incentivize OSPs <laughs> to take down content uh, overzealously, potentially, because their exclusion of liability rested on they taking down content as soon as they were made aware of it. So, so as studies have shown, OSPs appear to be taking down content more often than they ought to be. But that was seen to be okay because you had possibly multiply equally effective pathways to the internet. So, so if one OSP took down content overzealously, there was another platform onto which a user could actually post that content. But if you have dominant OSP platforms, which you increasingly have, then if one OSP takes down content overzealously, th there's no way for a user to post that content elsewhere, uh, potentially. Uh, and also from an OSP perspective, if you have just a few platforms out there, OSPs are increasingly under attack from rights holders, often not fairly, um, because uh, 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 and the costs of enforcement in terms of notice and takedown are quite significant. Uh, and that was not always contemplated when uh, the e-commerce adaptive safe harbors were actually set up. Um, because you have just a few, if I'm a rights holder, I'm going to I'm going to go after just those few OSPs out there. Uh, the other question to ask is, um, it was always assumed that OSPs cannot, as a technical matter, monitor what their users do or to filter what their users do. Um, but today, it would seem that many OSPs not only serve content preferences of their users, but also create demand for that. So, you know, as you'll see on the internet, like your served up content uh, based on what the OSP's complex algorithm thinks you may like. Um, and that whole system uh, of online behavioral advertising and so on, uh, you know, is as interesting questions as to is it really possible for OSPs to monitor? Uh, and as you'll recall, Article 15 of the e-commerce directive assumed that they would not and they should not. But the, but the business of the internet today is in fact premised on serving you relevant content based on your, based on your preferences. And how close is that to actually monitoring or filtering? Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, OSPs face significant costs of notice and takedown because, you know, in fact, the, uh, I mean, the price of like success is that like rights holders go after you because if if they can force you to um, cooperate, uh, you know, infringing content across the entire internet comes down. So. So in terms of asking sort of like three provocative questions, and uh, I won't purport to give answers. Um, if in fact OSPs do lawfully monitor their users for commercialization purposes, right? Online behavioral advertising and the like. Uh, does, that, uh, does that mean that they have the ability and, and should they do so for copyright infringement issues too? So as I see it in the data protection world, um, user tracking and so on is highly regulated, but also legal. Um, on the other hand, in the copyright world, um, tracking and filtering and monitoring are sometimes seen as bad words. 
So um, the question to ask is, uh, you know, how does the change? So how does the change in 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 OBA online advertising um, and and serving up relevant content? How does that uh, relate to actual um, copyright infringement monitoring too? Second, OSPs retail their content uh, content of rights holders and also content of their users. Now, uh, so in in other words, they are in the middle of this complex web, right? Uh, and, and the rights holder perspective sometimes is, uh, because you are at the center of this web, uh, it means that you should have the central role in actually policing infringement on the internet. And the question to ask is, uh, that may be true, but um, uh, uh, you know, you're essentially pitting OSPs against their own users, you know, uh, and 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 as we have seen, uh, OSPs like everybody else uh, do have the right of freedom of business, uh, and and by making OSP central to the IP infringement regime, you're essentially challenging their business model. Are they are they more proportionate ways of uh, of actually policing infringement on the internet? Um, and third, if some OSPs are dominant, um, you know, what does that mean in terms of like due process and enforcement costs? So, um, so as Lawrence Essig pointed out to us many, many years ago, code can be law, uh, and uh, and the actions of OSPs can be as prejudicial um, as anybody else's actions are, uh, you know, like judges or police authorities, but. So should there be due process for end users when content is actually taken down? But equally, uh, you know, how does one fairly address costs that OSPs incur in enforcement? And that's not to be taken lightly. So 